Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Magnus. Good morning and welcome to In the Word, our uh, Bible study for this Lord's Day morning. We're hopeful uh, that we'll be able to be in worship uh, later on this morning, but for now we're grateful to be in the Word and beginning a wonderful new quarter of study on the topic of faith. And we, we begin in a great way with three lessons from the book of Acts. The book of Acts tells the story of uh, a story after story of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ as a result of the preaching of the gospel. And we'll be able to look at, at three of those stories here as we open up this quarter. Dr. Roberts is here and we'll be able to continue our conversation about, um, about these lessons and looking forward to a great new focus on, on faith. Looks like a good quarter. And, and, the book, and, and the book of Acts as well. Well, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit briefly about the book of Acts. Uh, where, did, where does it fit? It's volume two. Mm. The Gospel of Luke is apparently volume one. They both begin with a very similar introduction. Mm -hmm. And the grammar, the, the vocabulary, the style all the way through indicates that the same author and so it's the continuation. The, the gospel is the story of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. And then the Acts of the Apostles is the, the title we know it by, mm -hmm. continues on from that point. And, and some have said that it really should be entitled the Acts of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. because it was the Spirit of Jesus working through His followers mm -hmm. that really unfolded as history opened up and these, these chapters record for us. Yeah. Uh, the, the focus on Jesus does not end here. Right. It, it's just as strong as ever. Obvi it's obvious in the Gospel, it's a book about Jesus. But um, the preaching in the book of Acts is about Jesus. The, the impetus for it all is, is the resurrection of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the commission comes from the lips of Jesus. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is kind of uh, a, the book of Jesus, volume two, right. uh, what we call <laughs> the book of Acts. Um, chapter one uh, gives us the, the, the preparation for the, the great missionary and evangelistic outreach that we're going to read about. Mm -hmm. It begins with uh, the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. And the disciples asked the question, is this a time? Is this it's going to be the end of time? And yeah. Jesus said, it's not for you to know times or seasons. You are to be my witnesses. Yeah. And so out of, the, out of the confidence that he gives them of his resurrected presence with them, he gives them that commission. Mm -hmm. And then they, they reestablish their, the community of followers. They had, they had scattered after the death mm -hmm. of Jesus. And now the hope of the resurrection gives them the confidence to come back together, mm -hmm. to pray together, and to wait for God's Spirit to give them an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to begin witnessing, which happens in chapter 2. We call it the Day of Pentecost. It's a powerful chapter. Yeah, it is. And it, it, it gives us um, uh, the first glimpse at the message of the apostles. And it's definitely a message of focused on what God has done in Christ. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, thousands of people came to faith in Jesus and form a fledgling community that we call the church uh, in which they share their devotion to God and their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the passage that we're studying in Acts chapter 3 comes right after those Right. initial events on the day of Pentecost. It's interesting that, that these followers of Jesus made such a transformative uh, commitment to Christ, but they were still Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so chapter 3 begins as Peter and John go to the temple to pray. It's still part right. of their relationship right. with God. Um, and I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right that, that the temple is still the natural place 
to worship God. Mm -hmm. and, and it says they go at the, at the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon. And that was one of the two primary hours of prayer mm -hmm. when people kind of took off from whatever they were doing and would, if they lived near Jerusalem, would gather at the temple for prayer. Mm -hmm. And it was nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So they, they clearly are going to continue their worship of God. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to think that they were also looking for opportunities to, to evangelize. Uh, to share the good news. They, they have a story to tell. Yeah, they looking for and they certainly yeah. do take, yes. take, take advantage of that. It's interesting that the, the temple we think of as, as just an isolated building, mm -hmm. but it was a fairly small building mm -hmm. comparatively to what we think of as large churches today in a, a large complex or compound area. And so when they went to the temple, they're going to this general area Right. But the Christians apparently went to one particular place. Yeah. Uh, this colonnade of Solomon, or sometimes it's called the portico of mm -hmm. Solomon, or the, the porch of, Sto of Solomon, um, seems to be their customary gathering place. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a perfect place to gather. Mm -hmm. Like you say, the, the temple area was a whole complex. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the, the, the core temple to which had been added a couple of courts, a court of Israel and a court of women. But then Herod the Great had added this huge open air courtyard around it, the court of Gentiles, mm -hmm. and put a, a colonnade along one side of it that is a roofed area held up by columns. And that would have given them a place to gather out of the elements. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we've been to Israel. The element you have to worry about most in Israel is the sun. sun right? Right. <laughs> not, not the rain. Right. No, it's, that sun <laughs> is just a killer. Yeah. And so uh, this covered porch, uh, mm -hmm. it's, the word is stoa for a porch mm -hmm. like that, um, <clears throat> uh, would have been a great place to, to meet in, in the shade. And it seems like that was their customary meeting place mm -hmm. where they could have interacted with each other, but also with pious Jews who are coming to worship mm -hmm. and passing through the court of, of Gentiles. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, our printed text kind of jumps into the middle of the story here in uh, Acts chapter 3. Maybe we should rehearse what happens in the first 10 verses a little bit. You, you began the story, Peter and John, two of the apostles. They go to the temple to pray. Go to the temple to pray, that is to and, worship. And there's a beggar, as they go, asking mm -hmm. for alms. Uh -huh. A man who's been lame from birth. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows him. He's been there. It's his regular place, apparently. Mm -hmm. And Peter and John are asked for money. And Peter says, I don't have any money. Mm -hmm. What I have, I give you. But he looked at him intently. He looked yeah. at the man eye to eye. Yeah. I, I think that's a, an important phrase that we shouldn't overlook uh, because our tendency frequently when we see people in need, either physical need or financial need, is to look the other way, mm -hmm. isn't it? To, to avoid them. To avoid eye contact. Yeah. Even. I remember the first time I went down to downtown Baltimore. I grew up near there and first time I ever saw beggars, I was so embarrassed somehow. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't look at them. I just, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to out of curiosity, but I, I just couldn't make myself do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, think, I think what's going on here is when, when we look at someone in need, not, not stare at them, but when we look at them, we are recognizing their humanity. We are engaging them. Yeah. yeah. And so we do that. Now you didn't you didn't say your preacher joke. You right. said, well, silver and gold have I none. Right. He's so, a typical preacher. I don't have any money. <laughs> there we go. See, I, I wasn't going to let you drop that one. That, that's a good one. So off they go to worship, looking for opportunities for worship. And of course, beggars would have sat at the entrance to the temple area. Sure. Here you have people coming to worship. Um, and uh, they might be motivated to. It's where a crowd gathers, but it's also a crowd that has, you know, good motives. Right, yeah. right. And there were places inside the temple for offerings in the court of women. Hmm. So people did carry money to the temple and did have 
almsgiving in mind. Mm -hmm. Almsgiving was one of the three main activities in, in Jewish mm -hmm. uh, religion. And so um, it, it wouldn't have been unusual. But Peter says, what I do have, I give you. Yeah, in and the name then of Jesus. That, that we get this great statement, in the name of Jesus, uh, stand up and walk. In other words, Paul, uh, Peter makes it very clear right from the get-go that everything he does is about Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's in the power of Jesus. It's because of the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't just heal to heal as a, as a good deed. Mm -hmm. He heals as a witness to the power of God in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's very important because we're talking about faith. Mm -hmm. In this unit, and as our as our chapter as our title says, faith in Jesus. Right. Yeah, the faith we're talking about is not just confidence and confidence alone. Isn't there a song about that? Yeah. I have confidence and confidence alone. Uh, it's not that. It is a very concrete faith with a very specific object, and that is Jesus. Yeah. Um, well, what happens after he says, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk? The, the old song, <laughs> went walking and leaping and praising God, and that he jumped up and he could not only walk, he could leap. Yeah, yeah. So we could sing that song, but right. we don't want our viewers to quick turn off the, the TV. So we, we won't sing it, but uh, yeah, this is where the walking and leaping and praising God comes in. Now, that's the first 10 verses of chapter 3 that are not in our printed text. Right. But we just wanted to remind people of that. It's a fairly uh, familiar passage. What we're going to see now is the events and the preaching that took place after this. A crowd gathered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that reminds us uh, of the role that miracles, and spe specifically healing miracles, had in the ministry of the early church and it's parallel to the ministry of Jesus, right. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Where uh, J Jesus appears not to have come specifically to heal, right. but to proclaim the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But he used opportunities like healing opportunities mm -hmm. as kind of a springboard to the proclamation of the kingdom. Yeah. And that, that's happening here, mm -hmm. too, I think. Mm -hmm. We have a healing miracle, a crowd gathers. And Peter doesn't just say, okay, you know, you've seen my best act or something. Yeah. He says, okay, now I've got your attention. Let me tell you about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let me read the uh, printed text then. Uh, it's Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him up from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. 
Well, one of the things that's fascinating about this sermon that follows the healing is how well and, and deliberately Peter um, connects himself to his audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, w w what are some of the ways in which he does that, do you well, think? He, he begins by saying, fellow Israelites, men of Israel, but it's a connection he shares. He's mm -hmm. part of the, the people. Mm -hmm. And then relates, talks about the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers. Mm -hmm. So he, he focuses on their shared ethnicity mm -hmm. and their shared heritage. And faith. Uh, right. And their, their, their shared uh, faith, yeah. Uh, he, he a couple of times makes reference to the prophets Mm -hmm. um, once down in verse 18, through all the prophets, and then again in verse 21. So he says, we, sh we share a, a heritage of spiritual instruction and insight mm -hmm. from the prophets. So over and over again, he um, emphasizes this connection that he has to his audience. And I'm sure that would have helped them listen to him mm -hmm. and, and connect with him as well. That's something that we can do, I suppose, when we, when we teach. I remember my father used to teach um, high school, Sunday school class, and he would begin the first five minutes or more talking about the football game that happened in, in the local high school this past mm -hmm. week. And once when I got a little older and sassier, <laughs> more arrogant or something, <laughs> I said to him, why do you waste time in a you know 45 minute Sunday school class talking about high school football huh. and he said well I want them to know that I'm connected to their lives and I care about their lives if mm -hmm. if they're going to care about what I'm going to talk about I've got to show them that I care hmm. I care about them hmm. so at any rate he taught me something about connecting to your audience yeah um, Well, Peter identifies with them and, and emphasizes their spiritual connection as well as their ethnic and, and historical connection, but he doesn't mince words that they've got a problem, they've yeah. got a need. That's a good point. He doesn't soft pedal this. Mm. Uh, he doesn't just put his arm around them and say, you and me, we're buddies or You're something okay, like I'm that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he does let them have it. Uh, back in verse 11, this man is hanging on to Peter and John. That, yeah. that, that's in, a, after he walked and leaped and <laughs> praised God, he evidently ran over and gave them a bear hug yeah. um, and, because he sees them as the source of his healing, which in a way they, they were the conduit of it. Uh, th this is a dramatic uh, description, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The man held on to the, it's, it's the Greek word for seize. Hmm. It, it can be translated arrest. It, hmm. He sees them. <laughs> and then the whole crowd just Came running. runs yes. in astonishment. Um, in, in my study of this, the prodigal son parable, I read that in, um, in Near Eastern societies, for an adult male to run yeah. was considered inappropriate. Mm -hmm. You've, you've seen that? Yeah. yeah. And so they're, they're just so overwhelmed that, that they do something that custom really didn't allow. Mm -hmm. They come to this Solomon's colonnade that we've talked about. And this is all that Peter needs. He starts into his, his uh, sermon. And as you say, he doesn't, he doesn't mess around. Um, you pointed out earlier this amazing list of you did this, you yeah. did that. Um, let, let, let's rehearse some of those maybe. What, what's he accused them of? Oh, you handed him over to be killed. And yeah. you disowned him before Pilate, even That's though Pilate was word. ready to let him go. Yeah, yeah. You disowned the holy and righteous one mm -hmm. and asked that a murderer be released. Yeah. You killed the author of life. Wow. That is a list, and that's strong language, isn't it? It is. Killing, disowning. Um, Choosing a murderer over the yeah. author of life. I guess we, we can remind one another that uh, the murderer is Barabbas, yes. right? Yeah. yeah, Barabbas. And who was, he wasn't just a, I'll say, a common murderer. He was 
uh, an insurrectionist. Mm -hmm. He he was a, re a rebel mm -hmm. and was trying terrorist. To, a terrorist. Yeah, he was yeah, trying yeah. to overthrow the Roman government. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the the Jews would have viewed him as a super patriot, but to the Romans, he was little more mm -hmm. than a terrorist. And that's who was released in his place. But you're right. This language is so strong. But then the word but in verse yeah, 15 really turns everything, doesn't yep. it? God raised him from the dead. We are yeah. witnesses of yeah. this. And that's, that's a fact that they couldn't have known independently. I mean, there weren't, Jesus' resurrection was not witnessed by crowds of people True. the way his crucifixion was. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why the witness of the apostles was so important. Only a handful, a, a small, well. Paul later Paul says, later up to says 500, 500. But still, so at this time, it was a limited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's, it's not like all of Jerusalem saw the risen Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this is information that had to be preached and testified to by the apostles. And then verse uh, 16 is where we come to our theme word for today, uh, by faith in the name of Jesus. And once again, it's the, the, the Christian faith has a very concrete object. Right. It is Jesus. And it's Jesus. It's not the name of Jesus mm -hmm. like the, the verbal title as some kind of talisman or lucky charm. Brings us back to Hophni and Phineas story yeah. of carrying the Ark of the Covenant like it was a magic charm. Yeah. The name of Jesus does not mean just a title that you can bandy about loosely. Right. The word name, both in Hebrew and in Greek, signifies the person. Right. The person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's not. Uh, it's not that they had a magical name, mm -hmm. uh, like open sesame or abracadabra. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. We'll find later in the book of Acts when sorcerers had tried to do things in the name of Jesus and, and the, the evil spirits said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? Yeah. It was not the name, you know, the, just bandying it wasn't the name just without a magic, the relationship. Magic word, yeah. But Peter makes it very clear that it is by faith in Jesus that the healing occurred. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's his statement of faith, you know, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Mm -hmm. That precedes mm -hmm. the miracle. Mm -hmm. And then the miracle of healing occurs, and that's immediately followed by an explanation that it was, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, the power of Jesus that yeah. brought this about. And that the name of it is like the authority of, like we say, the name of the mm -hmm. law. It's the, the authority mm -hmm. given because of Jesus. He's yeah. the one that's doing it. Now, um, he, he goes on to talk more about Jesus in verses 17 and 18, but he makes it very clear that what, what they know about Jesus has been foretold by their own prophets. Mm -hmm. Even though the apostles have to bear witness to the resurrection, mm -hmm. the coming of a Messiah was long foretold, mm -hmm. including the possibility of suffering. The suffering, yes. And, and they were ignorant of it. He, he gives them that mm -hmm. allowance. You, mm -hmm. you do this in ignorance, as, as did mm -hmm. your leaders, mm -hmm. which reminds us of Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, and they know not what they do. Yeah. But, but that doesn't excuse the fact that it was still wrong, yeah. and they still now have a need to change, to, exactly. to repent. And that's, that's verse 19. Um, the, the suffering of the Messiah is brought out most beautifully and powerfully in Isaiah chapter 53. Mm -hmm. um, and he, so. he mentioned earlier the servant. Oh yeah, reference. yeah, we, we skipped over that. In verse 13, mm -hmm. uh, God has glorified his servant Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's the language, that's the term that Isaiah uses mm -hmm. for the suffering Messiah. Well, as you said, he doesn't let them off the hook. And in verse 19, he calls for their repentance and reorienting themselves toward God, God stands ready to forgive even a horrible act like disowning the Messiah, mm -hmm. but uh, it depends on their repentance. And the repentance is a, a sorrow for sin and a turning away from it, mm -hmm. but it's also a turning toward God, exactly. to Jesus. Yeah, right. Um, many people interpret this phrase, times of refreshing, as similar to the gift of the Holy Spirit or the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
Um, so that may well be what he means there. Mm -hmm. And then um, he's, he's looking on into the future here of the return of the Messiah. Right. In, the, in verse 20. And it's, it's almost like there's a sense of urgency. Yeah. There's, a, there's an end time coming. You mm -hmm. need to, to repent. You need to change your life now because the Lord is coming back. That's interesting. So repentance is not only based on what God has done in Christ, the, cr the cross. Mm -hmm. It's also connected to what God will do in Christ. Mm -hmm. That is a return in judgment. Coming, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that's interesting about this passage to me are the, the beautiful and meaningful titles of Jesus that we see scattered throughout. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first one is in verse 14, the Holy and Righteous One. What a, what a description that is of Jesus. And then, oh no, uh, the first one was earlier in 13. In 13. Servant. servant. There we go. Uh, the servant, which reminds us of the suffering of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have servant, Holy and Righteous One. And then this beautiful phrase in 15, the author of life. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the word author is not the best translation in my mind because it makes us think that he wrote the book on, you know, he wrote the book on life. Um, but the, the actual word suggests more of a leader or a pioneer or a trailblazer. And that brings to mind Hebrews 12, that pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Let us follow Jesus. So um, it, it's a great it's a great phrase that Jesus mm -hmm. is the pioneer or the founder or the leader of our lives. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Messiah is the other term that's used here of Jesus in verse 18. And that's the term that we get um, that is synonymous with Christ. Mm -hmm. The anointed one. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. The yeah. anointed one. So anyway, four great titles mm -hmm. for Jesus. I think we can also learn something interesting about communicating the gospel from this passage. What, you're, you're a longtime uh, professor of the art of preaching. <laughs> what, what do you see here that might help us as we communicate? The well, as you mentioned, Peter begins with this identification with the people to whom he's speaking and the connection to them. But in the process, he's, he's emphasizing their strong points, their historical strengths, their, their benefits, but also their need. Mm -hmm. And bring it to a point of saying, this is not just something to talk about theoretically. There's a critical need here, and here's the answer to the need. Mm -hmm. And Jesus has come for that answer. Yeah. I also like the way in which he reminds them of what they already know, Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't treat them like dummies. You, know, you already yeah. know this, but then he gives them something new that right. they didn't know about how God has been at work in Christ, especially mm -hmm. the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this brings us to the end of our discussion uh, this morning on our new topic, faith. And we've learned that our faith, Christian faith, has a concrete object, and it is in Jesus himself. It's a powerful, it's a healing faith, and it's, it's a saving faith as well. We hope you join us next week as we continue our exploration of passages in the book of Acts on the topic of our faith in Jesus. See you next week. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Maggs, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School Lesson Text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.